I want to thank Sister Makita for coming to bless us with the great gift God has given to us, her. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to thank Jonathan for reading the scripture for us today. You know, he's our new member. We praise God for him being with us today and all of the other participants today. Welcoming all of you again, all of our visitors who are visiting with us physically, as well as those watching on live stream, praise God. Thank you for tuning in today. Beloved, I'm so excited to just share with you because of the fact that we have lunch after church today, so throw away the watch. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> we thank God for being able to come and worship him in spirit and truth. There's many places in the land where you cannot do this. It's not allowed. So we're best to take advantage right now. What do you say? Let me get down to the business of today and begin this way. Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and hit Judah with a surprise, even though it should not have been because the prophet Jeremiah shared with them that if they did not obey God, if they weren't going to be faithful to the counsel and the truth of God's word and follow what the prophet was sharing with them, they one day will be taken into captivity and become slaves of another nation. Many of the leadership in Jerusalem at that time did not pay attention nor even take to heart the counsel that the prophet Jeremiah was giving them. And it came down one day, Jeremiah said, listen, it's all messed up. You're trying to get Egypt and all these other countries to come and ally with you to, to keep Babylon away, but that's not going to happen. You need to surrender. The leaders of Israel, the leaders of Jerusalem, decided to go with the false prophet. There's many false prophets in the land today, even today, brothers and sisters. That's why I pray that you have bought, brought your Bible with you to check on this preacher. Amen. The problem that we're having today, brothers and sisters, is that there's things happening that, that is going on outside of our sight, a great controversy like never before that is happening right now for our souls. God desires to save us, and the devil wants to save us to himself for destruction. There is a great controversy going on. And as Jerusalem of old did not listen to the counsel coming from Jeremiah, the prophecy is foretold right there in 2 Kings 25 that they will go into captivity. Brothers and sisters, let me share a few words with you right now on the subject, the image of the beast. Would you pray with me? God of heaven, once again I'm asking you to put your words in my mouth. Bind the enemy of souls, set him down, put him out if you have to, even if he's in somebody. May we gain the message today, especially myself, I'm just a willing vessel. I am not worthy even to say one word. So may your people and all of us hear you see you, feel the presence of the Holy Spirit like never before, and may we not be the same when we leave this worship. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. Beloved, I know that this is a topic that does not bring you comfort. I know it. Actually, it is one that would and has caused many to be uncomfortable and frightened. Many people like to run from the prophecies, but I'm telling you right now, as a preacher of the unadulterated gospel, I got to tell you the truth as we on, we're on this road towards the kingdom. I'm going to give you all the different types of variety of sermons, but we have to deal with prophecy at some point. 
But I'm not bringing this message to cause you to be uncomfortable. It's not my intention. But do now to the substance given in this message, guess what? I'm sure it would get most of your attention. Why do I think so? It got mine. And since Satan now gets most of our attention each and every day, at least God should get our attention at least one day out of the week. I figure it might as well be today. This is not a beat down sermon, so don't get nervous. I don't like those type. We need to be encouraged. Can I get a witness? However, it's a reality check based on the Bible and the gift of prophecy. It's regarding the signs of the times in which we are now living. Beloved, from the bottom of my heart, I love you, church family. Oh, yes, I do. And if you claim to only be a visitor, guess what? We claim you to be a part of the church family, this family. This is a safe haven where you can come and be fed spiritually and be nurtured and included socially, even in ministry. No one is excluded except for Satan. It might sound like a club, but it's not. It's a movement. It's what, everybody? Headed toward the kingdom of God. So now let's go to work. Dealing with the image of the beast. The people of God are now taken captive and taken to Babylon. And they were introduced now to pagan worship with their various rituals, pagan food, pagan dress, and a lifestyle that does not honor nor give glory to the God of heaven. So we go back and pick up the scene in Daniel chapter 3, looking now that there is a story there that is told by Nebuchadnezzar that has set up a big, large, 100-foot-tall statue, and he made it all gold. Now, in verse 1 to 30, it tells the whole story about this, and these three Hebrew boys standing rather than bowing, because in this chapter, and we're not going to read it all because of the time, but I'm telling you now, you have gotten a handout so that you can go do your homework. But here's the thing. Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, and we'll deal with that in a moment, he had a dream, and the succeeding nations, once he's, he got the interpretation of the dream, it showed that he was going to be passed on off the scene. But he did not want that, so instead, since that statue said that he was represented, represented the head of gold, he decided to make the whole thing go. By doing this, he's saying to God, I'm not going anywhere. And when he did this, brothers and sisters, it caused a ruckus, you see. And many people, all of those who were captured from Jerusalem, Judah, if you please, and they went down there in Babylon. And now here it is, this heathen king and this heathen nation has set up a, an image. And he wants everyone to worship it, which means worshiping him. And these three Hebrew boys decided that we're not going to bow down. We're going to stand. Mind you, brothers and sisters, they weren't the only church members there. The whole nation that is bowed now before this statue is church. Only three stood. Beloved, let me tell you something. We must realize and understand that the stories in the Word of God it's not just something nice to read or tell. They mean something to all of us today in these last days. Notice what the Bible says about the people in Exodus in 1 Corinthians, looking at chapter 10, 1 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 12. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat 
did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It was who, everybody? But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were for our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That ought to send us a hint. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples or examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And then, just in case we think we have it together, it says in verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Beloved, get it now. These three Hebrew boys stood tall. They did not bow down to the image of gold. Think about it. The question comes, though, how were they able to stand and everybody else bowed down under the death decree and they decided to stand? How were they able to do that? Here's some reasons, so stay with me. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1, it gives us the counsel of when they were taken into captivity and they were brought in and they was looked at fine young men, men, Daniel there with the three Hebrew boys, yes, Meshach and Abednego and all of those fellas. And they were taken and the king brought his meat in and they says, we're not going to eat that. I guess it was a pig with eyes looking back at them. But they decided they would not eat the king's food nor the king's drink. They decided that, listen, we're not going to eat that. And then the keeper of those guys said, if we don't feed you and you get sick, the king is going to take us out. He says, no, no, no. They decided, listen, let us have our fruits and vegetables, our pulse, if you please, and water, and then see how we do, and then give us 10 days, and then see how we do, and that will determine whether or not it's okay. They decided to take on that other diet, brothers and sisters, and they were, they were better than all the other rest that was eating and drinking from the king's table, all his meats and all of his drinks. They were be debilitated. But beloved, let me tell you, I want to go somewhere right here. Believe it or not, what we consume in our bodies can affect our minds. Our choices, which affects now our spirituality. This is why we have the health message. If you take drugs, if you drink alcohol, it affects your choices. So therefore, it affects your spirituality. What we eat and drink gets into our bloodstream. The Bible tells us in Leviticus 17, 11 and 12, the life is in the blood. We're not to eat the blood. Nor the fat, the Bible says. If the blood is tainted, then it will affect our bodies, and that blood runs even to our brain and actually causes us to become numb and not sensitive. Stay with me. Somebody getting mad right now, but stay with me. Life is in the blood. The pure blood is essential for clear thinking. It affects our choices. It affects our spirituality. This is why we have the counsel from diets and foods that tells us how we should care for our body. The story is there. These same three young men who stood and did not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, one of the reasons is because they had clear minds. But the others is all affected somehow. The only thing that you can read is that they stood, but the chapter before, in chapter 1, it showed what kind of diet they had. This is why the three Hebrew boys chose a plant-based diet. Now, don't get it twisted. I got to say this. I'm not saying you're saved by what you eat or drink. I'm not saying that. Not at all. We're only saved by the grace and the pure blood of Jesus covering our sins, who washes away all of our sins. That's it. 
But our choices are what can be tainted by having unpure blood. It affects our choices to serve God or not. And it does. You see someone that's drinking alcohol or, you know, taking drugs, they don't understand spiritual things. They're struggling. The devil gets an inroad to your mind, and, and it's hard to break that thing. Whatever you put in this body, it affects your mind. Think about it. It affects all of our choices to serve God or not. So, here it is again. Your diet can actually affect your spirituality. Inspiration tells us something, and it gives us this counsel. Diet and spirituality, intemperance, it's a sin. Let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. Our first parents' intemperate desire resulted in the loss of Eden. They ate the fruit that was forbidden. Christ went into the desert after he was baptized and he was tempted of the devil and didn't go for his stone food, turning the stones into bread. Where Adam fell, Jesus prevailed. He conquered diet. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if you can conquer diet, that's why we fast and pray, you can conquer any sin by the power of God. It would temperance in all things do more to our restoration to Eden than men realize. Beloved, please understand, I can go on and on and on, but this is not the sermon. But I want to remind you what's really going on behind the scenes. Our faces. Even in our faces, the devil is doing things in these end times. Revealing to us the things Satan is doing. What is he doing? To overthrow and destroy God's people with all of this corruption on television. And even the news and the commercials are showing disheartening corruption. But ask yourself the question. How can a committed Christian, one who say that they love God with all their hearts, sincerely ask God to protect them from temptation when they intentionally expose their eyes ears their most powerful senses to so much evil and in doing so deliberately invite satan into their lives their home and their life i'm going somewhere yes the image of the beast it's something to think about there's hope at the end of this i better tell you that now but there's a time when we must say no, and that time is now. It should always be now to say no to the devil's movies, to the devil's social media, clothes and music, you name it. That time is now. What did I say? It's always now. The Bible in broad principle and the spirit of prophecy tells us this counsel here. Many professed Christians are so benumbed by the same practice that their moral sensibilities cannot be aroused to understand that it is sin and that if continue its course, its sure results will be utter shipwreck of body and mind. Man, the noblest being upon earth, formed in the image of God, transformed himself into a beast. He makes himself gross and corrupt. Every Christian, what did I say? will have to learn to restrain his passions and be controlled by principle. Unless he does this, he is unworthy of the Christian name. Whew, that hurt me when I read that. You see, the devil influenced Nebuchadnezzar. This old king of Babylon, yes he did, and forcing the whole world to bow down to his image. Now this word image, it means character or characteristic. Worship me. Be like me. That's why he made a statue that looked just like him. But the three Hebrew boys, they stood tall. He wanted them to worship his image. Yes, worship him. Please get it, beloved. Our God created us in his image. And that's why in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, the scripture gives us this. 
And God says, let us make man in our image. And our what? After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, he, him, male and female, created he, them. The biblical definition now for the word image in the Old Testament scholars acknowledge that the Hebrew word for image in Genesis 1 is selem, often refers to an idol or physical image. Beloved, those of us who are Bible students get it now, know that the commandments of God is a transcript of his character. This is why he says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In essence, he, in essence he's saying, if you love me, be like me. On the back of the scripture sheets that you have is a comparison of God's character and his law. And many people want to throw that away. You don't have one, pick up one after church in the foyer. You see, my brothers and sisters, as we travel through this message that will get heavier and heavier, this is serious. Because reflecting now, i got to tell you, the image and character of Jesus in our lives is telling whose side we're on, who do we belong to. Stay with me. This is going to get deep. A deep revelation of what time it is. Every now and then, I have to give you a prophetic diet. Come on and say amen. If there was ever a time to intentionally make a strong effort to reflect the image of Jesus, it's now. Reading his word, praying, studying, focusing on the life of Jesus every day, serving in the church for him each and every day. And when you do this, notice what happens. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, or what? Into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is the Word that transforms, aided by the power of the Holy Spirit taken in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the agent that will help us do this. We talked about this in Sabbath school. So therefore, it is dangerous to grieve the Holy Spirit. And when we grieve it like this, and we want our image of ourselves, and we want to be worshipped, and we want to be liked, that's why the devil set this thing up. Seven ways to promote yourself on social media. You're on social media all day trying to show your pictures of how you look and using those little apps and stuff to make you look better than you look. And then you're putting it and sharing it all on your page and stuff. Like, how many likes I got today? You want people to like your image. You're spending all that time getting the likes on Facebook, getting the likes on YouTube, getting the likes on Instagram. Like me, like me, like me. And you're in competition with your friend because they got more likes than you. This is dangerous. The devil wants us to be just like him. Like me, he says. The devil tries to see every day he's getting likes from us when we surrender to do his will. He's getting likes from us. Now I'm talking about people wanting people to like your images of yourself. Some people on social media, that's all they want. How many likes you get today? Wow. Sitting in church while the sermon is going on, they're trying to get likes. Especially for non-spiritual material. See, you can witness on Facebook. Am I right or wrong? You can witness on social media, uh, YouTube, like right now. Amen. And guess what? It's the truth in the how, and I don't care if we don't get no likes. It's the truth in the how. You see, my friends, when you fully surrender to Christ and are baptized, you won't do these types of things anymore of lifting up self. Why? Because the Bible tells us this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? What kind of creature? 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Beloved, this message is about the image of the beast, and we'll turn the corner in a minute. So let's get to it in prophecy. When the Bible speaks now of beast, it's talking about a government, a kingdom, a ruling power, if you please. So there back in Daniel chapter 2, it tells us some things here. Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamt this dream, and, and, and there it is, that statue you see, and he saw the statue, the head of, a go, of, of gold, and the silver chest and arms of silver, and the, and the belly of brass, and the legs of iron, feet mixed with iron and clay, and here's a stone that cut out of the mountain without hands, and smashes that image, which represents the coming of Jesus, taking over the kingdoms of this world. But Daniel chapter 7 speaks now even in the same same government rulership that took place in line with this statue, the head of gold and that lion in Daniel chapter 7 is Babylon. Medo-Persia, chest and arm of silver, and that bear, that beast, Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs right there of brass represents Greece. Represents who? And then when we get to the legs of iron, it's Rome. And down in the feet, it's a mixture of Rome and other nations trying to come together, but they couldn't cleave, but that's another sermon. Beloved, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, these beast powers have already succeeded and gone off the earth, except for Rome is still here doing its thing. But let me make it clear. We can say instead of the image of the beast, we can say the image of a kingdom or a government. Notice what it says in Daniel 7, 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast, the fourth what? Shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. There it is. Which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Get it now. The devil is behind Rome. This fourth beast. Beloved, the devil wants all of us to worship his image. His character. And do what he does. That he can destroy all humanity. He don't have anything good for us. No, he does not. So he's working hard through the kingdoms on this earth to accomplish this. And that Rome, that's Rome and the United States. Yes, church and state is right at the front door. You see, Rome by her ecclesiastical power and what she calls the mark of her authority, declared that she has the power to change the times and laws of God's universe, the commandments of the God of heaven. So therefore, the Bible gives us this counsel where he says this, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, persecuted to God's people, and shall think, he thought he did, to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand a time and times and dividing of time. That's 1,260 years. That's another sermon. But I'm telling you now, that's what Rome thinks she's done. You know why she thinks she's done it? Because the whole world is following after her. The whole world. Revelation 13, 3. The whole world wonders after this beast power is doing that. So she now claims to have changed the sacred day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. Beloved, in these last days of earth's history, what's happened to God's people in Daniel's day will repeat itself. The church that's listed there in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, this false apostate church is Rome. This beast that comes out of the water is Rome. She has done this, yes, and she is being lifted up and supported by who? The United States of America, this second beast, starting with Revelation 11 through 8, 13, 11 through 18, that's going to support Rome and her dogma and push a significant thing that's right on the horizon right now. So in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, it talks about this second beast coming up out of the earth, unpopulated area. It in prophecy, you gained a revelation that this is the United States of America. But she does a number of things, and I like what it says in verse 16. 
And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. They get it in their hand when they just go along with it to be able to survive, but they get it in their forehead. I believe what Rome has done is right. And therefore, when we get to verse 17, we get the counsel. We get the counsel. Rome is doing this, but then the United States is going to support Rome and that no man might buy and sell save he had the mark or the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Stay with me right here. Beloved, what is it? It's this. The mark of the beast is enforced Sunday worship. That's Rome's mark of ecclesiastical authority, so she says. The name of the beast is the character of the beast or his image. We're talking about the image of the beast. The number of his name connects with buying and selling when you deal with all of the things that is happening behind the scene. Here the devil can get us three ways to fall and be lost. Don't sleep on this. You may not keep Sunday, and there's a lot of good, loving Christians into Sunday churches right now that has a closer relationship with Jesus than some of us. But when they learn this, other sheep that I have are not of this fold. Them I also must bring when they hear this unadulterated, straight testimony of truth. They will come and take the place of many people playing games over here. You may not have, you might not keep some, some, Sunday, but you may have his image, his character. Or you will succumb, succumb to buying and selling to just survive. The pressure is coming, y'all. In verse 18, it says, And here is wisdom. Let him that understand the count and the number of the beast, for the number is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Notice what the spirit of prophecy says for us to be doing in these last days. We are to warn men and women against the worship of the beast and his image. And it's what? Against the worship of idol, the idol Sunday. But in doing this work, we need not begin a warfare against unbelievers. Saying like, okay, you go to church on that day, you lost. No, you don't do that. When it's enforced, then it becomes the mark enforced. There's many people in other church forms that's doing better than us in our relationship with God. But in doing this work, we need not begin the warfare against unbelievers. We are simply to present the word of the Lord and its true dignity and purity before the minds of those who are ignorant or indifferent regarding its teachings. Christ triumphant, chapter 6. So now we look at the parallel of the Hebrew boys not bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's image, this forced worship in Babylon. But the whole church practically bowed down but these three Hebrew boys represent a third, as it says in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. I will bring a third through the fire. They was placed in the fiery furnace. I will bring a third through the fire and redeem them, and two-thirds shall be cut off. See, these stories are not in the Bible just for fanciful, fanciful teachings and nice story. No, 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 no. It parallels to the end times. That's where we are. So what happened in Babylon of old Forced worship is coming to the whole world. Forced Sunday law is happening, y'all. Some people say, what's the difference in a day? I'm going to tell you what's the difference in a day in a minute. You see, it's very significant that we will be challenged in these last days to bow down or conform to the image of the beast and his mark, which is in forced Sunday worship, yes, the false Sabbath. All the world is wondering after this beast power, but please understand Everything God has set up for mankind to give him glory, Satan has orchestrated a counterfeit. God says, get married. The devil says, shack up. Shack up. Or don't get married at all. Satan has orchestrated a counterfeit to give him glory. To give him glory. There's only one true day of worship that God has ordained. There's a seventh day Sabbath. Can I get a witness, somebody? We keep the seven-day Sabbath. It declares when we do this, we are truly worshiping who we belong to and what God we're truly serving, whose image we are alike. Amen? 
The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20, 12 and 20, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign, to be a what? Between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. It's more than just worshiping on the Sabbath, but by keeping the Sabbath, you're saying, God, I'm your child, and you're my God every day of the week. But when the Sabbath comes, you're identified that way. And in verse 20, hollow my Sabbath, that means keep it holy. Keep it holy. What did I say? It's already holy. God says keep it that way. Not doing thine own pleasures and all that, but that's another sermon. But I'm going to tell you, and they shall be a sign between you, me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord, your God. So by God saying that, the devil says, i got to have a day too, so I can be their God. You see that? The devil is slick as ice, y'all. The Sabbath is a sign that declares we worship the true God of the universe. The one that created the heavens and the earth. And Satan now has declared a day to be a sign between him and the people who choose to identify his day to be sacred. It's not a put down on other people, man, but we've got to tell people the truth about this, man. There's so many people in darkness, they don't know this. Let me tell you something. This thing is coming to a head, brothers and sisters, and the Sabbath is going to be a major factor of many people being lost or saved because the Sabbath identifies you with the true God of heaven, and any other day, not so. Even after many discover the truth about the Sabbath, many people who don't even know this, the ones that don't know, God doesn't hold them accountable. Thank God for his mercy, amen? Until they reject the truth of this tr Bible truth, of the true Sabbath. When the Sunday law is enforced, those who comply will receive the mark of the beast. And the next chapter in Revelation after that, Revelation 16 tells you the plagues are going to take care of those people. You see, those plagues are not really for God's people. It's for people that serve the devil. Amen? And Rome will be hit with this. But Satan is all behind this, brothers and sisters. He wants all of us to reflect his image. That beast power, Rome. Yes, he does. And as I mentioned earlier, the devil can get us to be lost in these three ways. You may not accept the mark, but you might have the image of the beast. You might come to church every Sabbath, but you hate your brother. You hate your sister. Now, let get this. Let's go back to a personal level. Let's go back to a personal level. Because what you do now, you will do then when it's enforced. When the chips are down, whatever you're doing now, you're going to do the same thing at the end. Let me make it more plainer. If you don't regard the Sabbath as being holy and something that you need to keep holy, as God has said in his word, now, when someone puts a gun to your head to say, recant this thing, you're jumping across the line so fast before they finish the sentence. There's no fire escape religion here, y'all. What you do now will determine your future. So what's the difference between the character, between character and image? Let's see. Image is what you are serving before others in the church. Fellowshipping with the friends and family and working on the job or at school, etc. Wherever you go, image. Character is what you are in the dark when nobody is looking but God. I always like to say this, the secret to being a saint is to be a saint in secret. <laughs> Beloved, if we want to reflect the image of God, remember this. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, they become your destiny. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, looking at verse 4 to 8, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly, brotherly kindness, charity. And then it concludes this way, because this parallels with what I just shared with you. For if you do these things, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God. You see, we've been promised by God that we can be transformed back into his image, into the image of God. Don't you want that? Don't you want to reflect the image of God, the image of Jesus? Instead of the image of the beast, you can. Oh, yes, you can. The counsel is given the great plan of redemption of the fallen race was wrought out in the life of Christ in human flesh. In human what? This scheme of restoring the moral image of God in debased humanity entered into every purpose of the life and character of Christ. What others may do, what others may say, what others may think of you will not change God's thought towards you. Praise God. That's why I don't worry about what people think. I worry about what God thinks. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. And the opinion of man will not change his character. Jesus loves you. He what, everybody? Do you believe he loves you? And he takes no man's measurement of your character. You are to behold Jesus and reflect his image. Keep his love in your thoughts. Invite the heavenly guests to abide with you. And as the music plays and I wrap up, and remember... Character is synonymous with image. Give Jesus your heart today. Give Jesus your heart today that you may reflect his image and not the beast. Don't you want that? God is calling us at such a time as this. Oh, yes. I finished a little earlier than I thought, but God is not finished. This thing about the image of the beast is real, y'all. While this great church is on a mission, the devil is working behind the scenes to overthrow everybody that claims to be a child of God. I said earlier that he has a plan of redemption and that is to win us back from our allegiance to the God of heaven. He has the gospel too. And many of it, much of it is on social media. Can I get a witness? Many people's image have been turned into the image of the beast, or just say the image of Satan, because he's behind that beast power, the apostate, because they're so engrossed with all the things in this world that has nothing to do with Jesus. Absolutely nothing. But our God is in the business of saving all of us, especially me. I want Jesus to save me, and I want Jesus to save all of y'all. You know how I know? You ought to know. I'm going to always tell you the truth without a chaser <laughs> so that you can be saved. I'm not going to give you no fluff and puff. No, I'm going to give you the straight testimony. Am I going to preach the mark of the beast every week? No. But every now and then, you got to hear what time it is. Come on and say amen. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you want to share the love of Jesus with others? How many of you are in the, in, the, in the mode now of sharing the love of Jesus with others? You see, when we come together on Sabbath, it's a convocation. We ought to be testifying with one another and to one another about all the things that the Lord has led us to do in touching lives for Jesus who are in darkness out in the community all week long. We should come together in a holy convocation just praising God for what he's doing in our lives, touching other lives for Jesus all week long. It's not just being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It's being a seven days Adventist Christian. Can I get a witness now? God is going to save somebody. Might as well be me. Is that your testimony? But we are not to be selfish. We need to share our, our faith and share the truth of God's word, especially by the life we live and the love we give. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. But there's someone here struggling, struggling, struggling. 
or something going on in your life, Jesus can break that stranglehold of the enemy and set you free because you're struggling with that thing that is causing you to become more like the devil in his image. God can break that. But if you need prayer that you can be broken away from that and you want to give your mind and heart to Jesus going forward and you need that power, you need that prayer, please stand. I'm standing first. Our God wants us to have his image, not the image of the beast. And let me tell you something, to give you some encouragement. You don't have to worry about the image of the beast and the National Sunday Law and all that other stuff if you have a viable, true relationship with Jesus. If you don't, you will have to worry because you'll wake up one day and the plagues will be falling on you because you have his mark, his mark, his mark. Now, there's someone under the sound of my voice that has not connected their lives with Jesus, and maybe you heard something today, and the Lord is pricking your heart, that you want to study his word and prepare for baptism. If that's your testimony, simply raise your hand. Simply raise your hand. You see, when you go to these worldly events, all the leader in front of that whole crowd, like a concert, can say, wave your hand if you don't care and you want to be a part of it. Everybody raise their hand to worship the devil. But when we ask you to raise your hand to commit to Jesus, it's like telling you to put your hand in fire. But the day will come where you will not hear that appeal anymore. His voice would get softer and softer, and that'll be it, I-T in capital letters. But our God is not about destroying you. He wants to save you. He's pleading. There's times where I shed tears up here trying to give an appeal because I can feel the resistance you're not resisting me, you're resisting Jesus. And I know many will be lost because of that. But if time is winding up and probation is closing, the hinges of mercy is squeaking because the doors is about to shut. Please don't let this time go by without you committing your life to Jesus. I'm going to pray for all of us under the sound of my voice. You're standing, maybe you're still sitting. But there's somebody here that want to be rebaptized, recommitment. We have a baptism coming up on the 22nd. If you want to be in that number, simply raise your hand right now. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm just going to follow you around once the benediction is done. <laughs> Maybe you want to get rebaptized. Maybe you want to get baptized for the first time, or you finished Bible studies and you want to be baptized. Please see us. Maybe you want your membership transferred. Maybe you want, maybe you want to become a member by a profession of faith. Is there one here today? Any one of those categories? You see this stuff that's in the bulletin that you can actually participate in ministries is also commit to one of those things I just shared. How many of you love Jesus? How many of you plan to go all the way to have the image of Jesus and the image of God and not the image of the beast? It all works together in the end because it's like this, and then we're going to pray. We talk about the mark of the beast. We talked about the, 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 the seal of God. Every single day, what did I say? Every single day, we are being marked or we're being sealed. If you do the things that please Satan, you are being marked. Step by step, you're being marked. Every time you do something against God, you're being marked. You're being marked. You're being marked. Every time you do what pleases God, you're being sealed. And you're being sealed. So when, guess what? When probation closes, you're marked off or you're sealed off a done deal. Let's keep that in mind. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's someone here that needs to take their stand for you. But I'm going to leave that between you and them, oh God. But I'm asking you to give them no rest nor peace until they decide for you. God of heaven, do what you do best. All of us are standing in recommitment to you. May you bless, oh God, in a very special way. Please, oh God, Help us to understand that it's easier to be saved than to be lost. We don't have to work our way. We can't work our way into heaven. Just have a relationship with you, a meaningful one, a meaningful one, one that's sincere and earnest. <coughs> that's it. So God of heaven, speak to all of our hearts right now. And for those that are in the valley of decision, Lord, give them no rest, no peace until they decide for you. 
And for all the issues that we're dealing with, Lord, take the whole load right now. No strings attached. Fix it. Whatever's broken, make it straight. Oh, God, fix it. Save us even from ourselves. And when you shall come in the clouds of glory to take us home, oh, God, may we be found on that sea of glass ready to go. And once this prayer is concluded, the appeal is still open. May you move on hearts that we may follow up with, with their needs. Save us when you shall come. Thank you for blessing the petitions that's going on in every heart. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Please remain standing as we have our closing prayer. I mean, I